All right, everyone. My apologies for the delayed start. Thank you so much to Wave of Trust Scott for her incredible presentation. As sterile processing professionals know, the cleaning process is such a critical part in preparing surgical right, devices everyone. for use My on patients. For the delayed start. Thank you so much to Wave of Trust Scott for her incredible presentation. As sterile processing professionals know, the cleaning process is such a critical part of preparing surgical right, devices. Everyone, Our next I educational session will detail the why behind cleaning verification and provide a deeper understanding of qualitative and quantitative tests and the meaning of those results. And I'd like to turn that over to Janet Pruce. Okay, hello everyone. Um, thanks so much for joining in. Um, amazing presentations prior to me. If you have a chance um, later to listen to the webcast, if you missed any of them, all extremely informative. And really hit home um, of, of why what we do in sterile processing is so critically important and really stressing um, the why and how it happens, and then also the why of the impact that it has on the patient. So really oh. amazing information and the latest in kind of the scientific understanding. So now we're, we're going to switch gears a little bit, and we're going to talk about fundamentals of cleaning and cleaning verification and describe the different technologies that are available and specifically focus in on adenosine triphosphate, or what is known as ATP, for cleaning verification or cleaning monitoring or cleanliness monitoring, all those terms are the same thing, essentially checking to see if the cleaning was effective prior to the next step in the process. And then I won't spend a whole lot of time towards the end of the presentation, but I'll touch just a little bit on the evidence related to this, um, this area, both of the need um, based on patient infection and patient concern and also the, the concern about patient safety, but that was covered so well by the previous speakers, I really don't think we need to spend a whole lot of time on it. Um, I am an employee of 3M Medical Solutions. You'll be able to see that on my bio off to the left hand, right hand side rather on your screen. All right, so what do we know and why is this topic important? I'm not sure I even need this slide anymore after listening to the people prior to me. Um, but we know that biofilm can form quickly, and we also know that it's extremely difficult or maybe impossible, right, to be able to remove that biofilm. Um, you heard about numerous patient, patient infections, um, both from the speakers prior to that for individual cases, what's in the literature. There's no question that we know that patients get infections when contaminated items and surface, they're exposed to contaminated items and surfaces. And, you know, if we do things right, and we do, we follow what the guidelines say, we follow what instructions say, we do everything that we can, it is, should be possible that those transmissions should be preventable or at least at a minimum really, really greatly reduced. You know, we've presented some present, or some examples of, of actions that physicians had taken that, that did show that they could successfully perform surgical procedures and not have postoperative uh, surgical site infections. Um, maybe not totally 100% preventable, but what we do needs to be focused on how do we minimize that risk as much as possible. What we're seeing in the updates of guidelines that are published by professional organizations and standards coming from standard setting organizations is that they're starting to recommend the use of cleaning verification as a quality control tool, and that's the majority of what we'll talk about today. And then checking those items and devices, why, did we, why is that important? Why is it important to have a good quality control program is because it obviously reduces risk. But we know that current practices are still far below the recommendations. There's still numerous citations from the compliance organizations related to uh, cleaning, disinfection, sterilization of medical devices and also of uh, patient, uh, the environment of care surfaces. Um, and so we'll talk a little bit about some ways that you can look at to potentially um, reduce your risk and be following these recommendations. Uh, cleaning rationale. We all know what the purpose of cleaning is, right? Is that the surfaces um, need to be clean and disinfected to prevent transmission of pathogens to the next patient. And if we talk about surgical instruments or flexible endoscopes, we know that they need to be cleaned and either disinfected or sterilized to prevent, again, transmission to that next patient. All the soil has to be gone from the surfaces otherwise, you know, and from the items, otherwise the disinfectants or sterilants aren't able to penetrate through the organic matter and then they can't be efficacious to achieve 
the desired goal, whether that be disinfection or sterilization. We talked about it, soil pr pr can protect the microbes. I mean, both of, of Joe and uh, Weva talked a lot about, um, you know, the action of how biofilms form um, and then the impact that it has on those subsequent processes. Um, and we also know that those surviving microbes have, and within a biofilm, have the potential to transmit an infection to another patient. So what we're seeing is as a result of that, because there's been a lot of publications, there's a lot of evidence out there, and there is a very large focus um, from most facilities, certainly the compliance um, auditors and the other um, uh, stakeholders to be able to reduce surgical site infections and also HAIs, is that there's really so much more emphasis now on making sure that we have appropriate cleaning procedures and that the standards and guidelines are updated and they're beginning to really emphasize the importance of monitoring that cleaning process. We always know cleaning is important. We always need to understand that cleaning has to be efficient in order for those other subsequent processes to work. Unfortunately, it wasn't highlighted as much as it, as it should be in the standards, but that's starting to change right now. Um, so why is that important, okay? We thought, you know that what we're worried about is microorganisms and the microorganisms that are on a surface or on the surface of a device or for that matter in the internal channels of a device or within the complex geometries of the device is that we want to re we need to remove as much of that as possible so that we're reducing the amount of bio burden or contamination or organic soil, whatever you want to call it, um, so that then when it's exposed to the disinfectant, or a sterilization process that, that can be effective. Both disinfection and sterilization processes have so you know a defined amount of basic lethality. It's different for both of those, and that's the topic of a whole other talk. Um, but you need to remove there may be more on that device after it's used on the patient or been exposed in the environment than what those disinfectants or sterilization processes are able to kill. So removing as much as possible that ensures that that subsequent process can be effective. And that's the whole theory behind it. But I also want you to realize is that microorganisms rarely, except in a maybe a laboratory setting, are they sitting on a device or a surface all by themselves. They're not. They are within something, right? Some uh, kind of a uh, slurry of tissue, blood, extracellular debris, you know, secretions, excretions, blood, urine, saliva, serum, all sorts of things. Um, and so when you get the device in, into the sterile processing area, or if you're in environmental services and you're out there, you're cleaning environmental surfaces, even within the sterile processing area, you're not you know, the goal is not intended to eliminate the microorganisms. The intent is to remove as much as you possibly can. And what you're removing is all of this uh, materials together, which are typically referred to as either organic soil or clinical soil, meaning that basically that there's living components within that soil. So that's really the purpose. And when you remove all the gunk, the microorganisms go along with it. But we also know that cleaning doesn't remove everything and it certainly is not intended to kill the, any remaining microorganisms that are on those devices. So that's really our purpose of it. Um, we know, and this is what we talked about earlier, right, is that if, it, if all of that uh, clinical soil is not removed, then it forms this matrix, the biofilm forms, and it makes it just about impossible to remove. So microorganisms include bacteria, fungus, protozoa, the whole thing. Um, on the surface of device, so we talked about biofilm. We won't go through that um, in any detail because that was better covered <laughs> by the previous speakers. But why are we so concerned about, you know, not only infections but the outbreaks and why does it seem like there's more deaths and uh, patient infections occurring than what maybe we saw 10 years ago? I'm not sure that's actually the case, but one thing that definitely has changed is that the microbes have sort of changed the game. I have two games on there, I'm not quite sure. Um, in that, uh, and you heard about it from, um, um, you know, Bill Schmelzer today is that drug-resistant organisms that then can't be treated um, are more virulent and they have a higher rate of morbidity and mortality, death and illness associated with them than maybe uh, organisms that we could treat in the past with effective antibiotics. And now I'm sure you all recognize the little microbe that's down there in the corner. That's obviously COVID-19. And whereas 
it's not officially defined as a multi-drug resistant organism. We just don't know which are the right, right drugs that actually work against it. So the point being is, is that <clears throat> those not only multi-drug resistant organisms, but um, and including um, COVID are kind of in this category of superbugs, right? That we basically don't have effective methods in order to be able to treat the diseases that are caused by these organisms. All right. Um, so what, I have a question for you, and if I could figure, I've been able to figure out <laughs> more effectively how to use this very nice program that Beyond Clean has for presenters, I would have put this in a polling question, but I'm just going to ask you, um, what is one of the greatest risks to patients after admission to the hospital? All right, and if you answered, all right, is it that one of the potentials would be whether that room is cleaned effectively or not? You know, one of the answers might be the condition of the patient going into the hospital. But actually, there's some work that was done in about five to eight years ago that talked about admission to a room previously occupied by a patient who was colonized or infected with a multi-drug resistant organism was the greatest risk to the patient of them developing a multi-drug resistant infection if they were in that same room. Um, as that previous patient. So really, really important. And it's really some of this work that was done that really started to highlight, you know, the importance of the environment. And you'll see in this presentation, I'm going to talk both about environment and I'm going to talk about surgical instruments and I'm going to talk about endoscopes. Because the cleaning requirement and the importance of the cleaning requirement applies very similarly to all three of those applications. And ATP and cleaning verification can be used in all three of those applications. So this is about the environment. All right, so what are the risks with patients with flexible endoscopes? We know back in 2015, all of our eyes were opened with those uh, outbreaks related to duodenoscopes and patients that had undergone ERCP procedures. Um, and the multi-drug resistant organisms, the CRE family, and also the number of deaths that were associated with it. And there was a lot of flurry and a lot of activity. And even prior to that, and you'll see in some of the slides towards the end of the presentation, um, there was data out there prior to 2015 that said there was a problem with these endoscopes. Um, but unfortunately, there wasn't a good um, understanding of the complexity of it, um, the inability to effectively clean these endoscopes, so the subsequent disinfection processes really weren't working very effectively. We didn't understand that they got damaged. All, all of those kinds of things that I'm sure you've heard um, educational presentations regarding. But the important point of this is that the problem is not solved. All right, despite the fact that there's been updated guidelines and updated IFUs and all of that, is that there are persistent reports of endoscopes still being contaminated, and it's not just duodenoscopes or EUScopes. It's every type of flexible endoscope that's out there. And in 2018, there was a publication by a group of researchers out of Johns Hopkins where they looked at at uh, basically post-procedure data of patients that were admitted back into the hospital in, or in emergency room visits um, that had had endoscopy procedures. And what they found is that whereas prior to 2015, what was published is we thought the risk to the patient of, of um, getting an infection after an endoscopy procedure was extremely low, like 1 in 1.8 or 1 in 1.6 million. Well, as it turns out, it, it's not that at all. It's more depending on the endoscope type and the type of procedure that's being done, it could even be as high as like one in a thousand, which according to the World Health Organization of the WHO kind of classifies that as a common. So there's a, a common risk for infections for patients that have undergone endoscopy procedures. So what does that mean? That just means that there's gotta be more focus on improving those guidelines and there has to be a better emphasis on better quality control. And we'll talk more about that in just a moment. So what's the risk for a patient, if, um, a patient ready instrument that's a surgical instrument that's contaminated? Well, obviously a sur it could cause a surgical site infection. Uh, there was discussion earlier about undetected retained debris. The, the item, you know, is contaminated if it has debris on it. And if it's undetected, then that's the bad part, right? That no one knows. And then that, that uh, surgical instrument is used on the patient. Um, it could potentially compromise the sterility or in risk contaminating other items in the set. Um, and certain types of ster sterilization processes, right? We know that low temperature sterilization is really sensitive to any organic residue. So if it's not clean enough, 
it's very likely that those low temperature processes will be ineffective because that biofilm and that debris remaining on the instrument, even if you can't see it, it absorbs the sterilant. So then it's not as effective of um, uh, sterilizing the entire load. We all know lumens and very complex geometries are a challenge to clean for surgical instruments. And so whereas you know, the majority of our instruments um, are steam sterilized and steam is extremely effective, not quite so sensitive if it's not, not super clean. However, we know that surgical instruments have a lot of lumens and complex geometries, right, with with ratchets and mated surfaces um, and that um, and hinges, and these are extremely challenging to clean. And over time, again, as your previous speakers talked about, if we don't remove everything, then it fairly quickly builds that biofilm that is then impossible to remove. So. Uh, Effective disinfection or sterilization is dependent on effective cleaning, all right? And we know that if it's poorly cleaned, it's likely that those subsequent processes of disinfection, um, high-level disinfection for flexible endoscopes or sterilization are going to be um, inadequate, and then that gives a higher risk of transmission to the patient. And if you improve the cleaning, you're going to lower the risk of that patient. So how are we doing that, and what is the focus to do that? It's basically two, three things, I'll say. One is is that there is more pressure on manufacturers that are, um, you know, launching new devices to have instructions for use for cleaning and uh, processing that are, are have good usability, right? And they have to test for that, test actually in healthcare facilities to see whether or not those instructions can be followed effectively and the standards and FDA are setting those requirements out there. Um, there's also a much greater in emphasis now on inspection, so visual inspection, and not just taking a glance at it. It's under lighted um, magnification to look at those devices and to see not only if there's any residual debris, but is there any damage that could potentially be harboring biofilms, things like that. And then also implementing cleaning verification. So I'll mention it one more time. If I say verification, or you hear cleaning monitoring, or you hear cleanliness monitoring, they're basically all the same thing. It's using some sort of a test to determine is it basically clean enough so that as the next step in the process happens, it can be effective, right? So let's talk a little bit about basic definitions. I think this crew understands pretty well what these are, but there are a lot of people that, at least for cleaning and disinfection, they tend to use them simultaneously. But I want you to have it be very, very clear that cleaning is not disinfection. Cleaning is about removal. Disinfection is about killing, right? And it kills under certain conditions. So a certain, you know, liquid disinfectant concentration for a certain amount of time, sometimes at a certain temperature. And whereas it does have significant uh, lethality requirements, at least in the United States, to be labeled and sold as a disinfectant, um, at, for high-level disinfection, it doesn't kill everything. There could be some level of bacterial spores that are, are remaining. Sterilization, we know, kills everything. So it's required to kill that high level of organisms or 10 to the 6 you know, million organisms of the organism that's been defined most resistant to that process. And then sterilizers, the cycles have to be doubled. For what it takes to kill everything, then you double the time. So sterilization has this very large overkill or what's called a safety margin. Um, and it's validated to show that. So contrasting it to high-level disinfection, there is no safety margin. The requirement is for the disinfectant to kill those six logs of organisms, but not all spores. Um, and there's no safety margin. But really understand that difference, and then when you're talking about it and when you establish your policies and procedures, don't mix up cleaning and disinfection. They should be separate. In an environmental application, sometimes cleaning and the disinfection, it's not high-level disinfection, but it's typically low or intermediate-level disinfection, right? Because according to solving in an environmental application, you know, it would come... The item, whether it you know is a bed rail or a sink edge or a faucet or a remote control, 
would come in contact with normally intact skin. So according to Spalding's classification, lower intermediate level disinfection is, is um, satisfactory for an environmental application. But in environmental, there's very often now a lot of products, especially whites, that, are, that do both. They kind of remove any uh, gross organic soil and then the disinfectant sits on there and uh, soaks for whatever is the exposure period of time for that particular uh, disinfectant to be effective. So keep in mind that these are, these are very, very different and understand what those differences are. So even though it's visually clean, that might not be mean that it's clean enough because I think, as you heard, you can't always see biological re residue. They're microscopic. You can't see that with your bare eye. You, you can't see biofilms or microbes ever, <laughs> and you can't see inside long, narrow lumens. Now, the advent of some of the inspection tools of magnification and boroscopes is helping us do better with that. But even with those those items, you're still using your eye. You you can't see biofilm and you can't see um, low levels of microbes and debris. And that applies for flexible endoscope, surgical instruments, and environmental surfaces. So what is cleaning? I mentioned that cleaning is really the effective removal of clinical soil. But what are we really looking for? We're looking for tissue. We're looking for whatever is that slurry that it's sitting in the blood and the other body fluids and then within that will also be bacteria or fun fungus or viruses or other types of microorganisms and what they all have in common is that they're all kind of defined as this organic soil or bio burden or clinical soil so the microbes sit within all of this mixture and that's an important thing to understand so how do you figure out whether or not that soil is still there and if you clean something how do you reduce it there is a way to do it so what you do is that you you know for cleaning verification it's ensuring that you've reduced that as much as you possibly can versus having a large amount that then may interfere with the subsequent disinfection or sterilization process so to figure out what, how much you've removed is you pick something that's in that soil, all right? And then you're going to have a mechanism to be able to measure that. And these are, this is a very nice slide of the organic compounds that are typically found in clinical or organic soil in healthcare settings. And so that includes a bunch of different car of carbohydrates, fats, lipids, and proteins, of which there are different types of proteins, nucleic acid, RNA, DNA, nucleotides, and then what are called high energy compounds. All right, so this is the energy that fuels the cells that allows the metabolism of the cells, and ATP is one of those. There are some other kinds as well. So what you do is you pick the ones that you think are going to, the, that you want to measure. And in healthcare settings for cleaning verification, the two most common ones are proteins. You pick a protein. Um, or, or high energy compound, and so it's ATP or protein. So what are the differences between these? You know, there are some differences, um, but they're both, the important part is, is that they're both a component of this clinical soil. So there's different types of proteins that are out there. Hemoglobin is actually a protein. There's enzymes that are proteins. ATP is actually an enzyme that's a protein. There's hormones and there's antibodies. And so this is the molecular formula for ATP. So remember, ATP is an energy compound. It gives the cell um, basically the power to be able to replicate and metabolize. And how does it work? So you'll hear the word bioluminescence technology. So it's kind of cool. You know, it uses um, an enzyme um, called luciferase, and it's the same enzyme that fireflies use to light up their tails. And I live in Minnesota, so we're, and it quite seen fireflies yet, but they should be coming anytime. And so what it does is that luciferase is that the technology pulls out luciferin, it combines it with oxygen, and when that happens, it produces light. And so then you have a measuring mechanism and a luminometer to say how much light did it generate. The nice thing about um, ATP bioluminescence technology is that it's quantitative. So it gives you a numerical result because it's measuring the amount of light. So it can give you tell you whether it's a little bit of light or it's an awful lot of light uh, or a very, very high amount of light. And then because you have a number, you can analyze that number and you can look and see over time, are your numbers coming down or in a case, does it go up, meaning something's really wrong and this item isn't clean enough. And it gives you, you know, and it's validated against the other methods. So the way that we figured out, you know, how much ATP is clean enough 
was based on validating against some of the other accepted methods like protein. ATP is not new. It has been around for a long, long time and is used in, you know, to making sure that the environment when our food is produced is, is clean in aerospace and in clean rooms. So it's not new at all. And it's pretty simple, right, is that if you have more clinical soil and that organic organisms and organic residues, then you're going to see more ATP because all of those things are producing ATP as part of an energy compound. And then you're going to see more light or what's measured in relative light units or RLUs. Um, and so the systems that are available basically use that technology to generate light, and then the equipment measures the light, and then they record it. So ATP is present in all living cells. Sometimes you'll hear people say, well, it's only available in dead cells, and that's not true. Um, it's avail you know, It is present in all living cells and also what is left behind for living cells. So after the cell dies, the ATP doesn't necessarily go away. So um, in what we're trying to remove from instruments, they might be alive, they might be dead. We really don't care. We just want them gone, right? And so um, it, it's going to be a very effective measurement of that clinical soil that's there that our goal is to be able to remove. Um, and it's a great universal marker for organic soil, right? Um, there was work done back in 2015 by uh, Dr. Michelle Alpha out of Canada where she really started to look at ATP and, and asking, you know, how fast does that go away? And so this is really the publication and the evidence to show that it does persist um, and that it's not just based on, you know, dead organisms. So if you hear that, that's absolutely not true. Um, I want to talk a little bit about protein tests because we've all heard about protein tests. They're also very widely used. Um, and um, for both of those applications, um, more for surgical instruments and endoscopes, but also there are protein tests that are available for environmental surfaces as well. And there's essentially two types, though, that you should be aware of. So the kind that you see in hospitals, all right, that are used for uh, testing, cleaning, you know, mon or cleaning, monitoring, or verification for surgical instruments and primarily for endoscopes, um, are commercially available. They are visual tests. So they're basically an indicator strip that changes color. And they have about a five minute readout time. There's different ones that are available from different companies. Um, and they're, they have clinical performance publications showing that they're effective of monitoring the environment. Um, and what they're looking at is they're really kind of measuring any extracellular proteins that are available. And the color changes are set at a benchmark level. So there are some benchmarks, like how clean is clean enough, that have been established primarily for washer disinfectors, and they're in some international stan ISO standards, um, and also mentioned some AIMI standards for medical device manufacturers. So they set that benchmark level, and for protein, it's 6.4 micrograms per centimeter squared. Doesn't make any, that's not really all that important. You just know that the manufacturer has set their color change at that benchmark level um, and that there's some basis for that benchmark level. Um, there also are laboratory assays that are protein tests. These are very different than what, what you see right here. And those you actually can quantify. So if you can only see a color change, you know, that's a, qualitative method. Does it pass? Does it fail? A quantitative method gives you a number so you can see how how bad did it fail when it fails and even how much below is it a benchmark when it passes. So there are protein tests that do that, but they're not the kind that are typically used in sterile processing at all. They're lab tests, all right? And so they require you to take different samples and then at the end of that, they read it with a spectrophotometer. But so far, there's not, those are not broadly available in the you know, application for a sterile processing or environmental services department. So for environmental tests, there are a couple of others. So the way that we also test the environment is visual, just like in, in, in reprocessing, you look to see if you see anything. There's also uh, basically cultures or aerobic colony counts, all right? So somebody, usually your IT department or maybe your uh, safety department will go in once a quarter and they start swabbing surfaces and they put them on the plate to see if anything grows. But there are also in, in environmental applications, fluorescent dyes and powders and gels. So the idea behind that is, is it's like a black light, you know, use a black light, for fluorescent piece, and then you shine a black light on it and if you see anything, that fluorescent dye, again, attaches to any residual organic debris that's uh, available and you'll see... Um, that it, it, it will glow. 
So the idea with the fluorescent dye pieces is that, you know, you do it as an audit in environmental services, go in and apply the dye in a room. The EVS person doesn't know. They go in and clean. And if you come at the end and you see that there's still some fluorescent dye, it's saying you didn't clean effectively. So different tests available for environmental. This could apply, you know, in when you do your environmental cleaning in sterile processing or in the OR. So there are recommendations to test. If I do a comparison of the different kinds of environmental monitoring that's available, they're listed here, right? Visual inspection should be done regardless, but it's really not a reliable measure of cleanliness. And then you can read through the rest of these. You know, fluorescent marker systems, all of these in an environmental tend not to be done each time. You certainly could do ATP each time for in high-risk areas. They tend to be more applied as an audit, you know, periodically go in and do some sort of cleaning monitoring. Um, and actually for environmental, the CDC recommendations, you know, basically give you a recommendation to test like 5% of your rooms every week um, and then be on a cycle to continue to do that testing. So different methods available. If I go back, we go back to device monitoring now and we do a compare side by side comparison of ATP and protein. They're both really good markers. They've both been around for a long time and they're commercially available. The key piece is, is that with ATP, you get a quantitative result. So you're getting a number that provides that data. And then from that data, you can go ahead and kind of monitor what you're doing. You can do some tracking and trending. It helps you identify whether or not, you know, are the numbers going up, meaning that that device potentially could be damaged, or the numbers going down, which means everybody is doing a really good job of improving the process. Um, and it will detect microbial ATP, but it is not a microbe indicator, right? Neither is protein. Neither one of them are a replacement for doing those microbial cultures to see exactly what's there. Um, but it is a good cleanliness marker. Um, and there are different manufacturers that have those different um, equipment to measure the amount of light that the ATP is producing uh, after testing a, a specific device, and they're not directly comparable because it depends. The different manufacturers have different RLU scales, so you have to make sure when you're figuring out what's going to be your benchmark with ATP, you see what that manufacturer is saying to set as um, what is basically clean enough. Protein, as color change, as I said, majority of them, um, they're subjective, they're color metric. Um, they're not really measuring protein in all cases, um, and they're not detecting, again, as I mentioned, they're not detecting specifically microbial proteins, so they can't be used as a determination of whether or not, neither one of them, if that item is safe to use on the patient. So after processing, neither one of them are effective for that, um, and so you shouldn't do that. Um, but the the there is really a measurement scale is based on that benchmark established in the standard. So if you get a positive protein test, you don't know if you're a little bit off or you're a lot off. But with a quantitative measure like ATP, you do know how far off it is. So a procedure testing procedure for ATP is pretty darn simple. You know, you basically they have little swabs or you do a water sample and you swab it on a surface of, say, your complex surgical instrument or on the hinge, and then you activate it, you put it in the luminometer, it gives you a result, and then that result actually gets downloaded into a database that then keeps that information that you can then assess by the person doing the testing or you can assess it by the different instruments. Um, and so when you know there's a lot of a, a really high RLU reading, you know there's a lot of ATP present, so you still have a lot of clinical soil and organic debris on the device. So what exactly is that RLU value telling you? As I said, it's how much soil is present. It's not telling you whether the, you know, the soil is dead or alive or specific microbes or if it's infectious or not infectious. But if you're using it in an environmental application, it's telling you that room needs to be either clean right, before it can be um, either disinfected or released to, as ready for the next patient. For endoscopy, it tells you that endoscope needs to be recleaned. And it's also interesting because if you have problems getting the endoscope or the surgical instrument, for that matter, clean, it may mean that that instrument or endoscope is damaged. It may mean that it's har harboring, harboring biofilms. So it gives you that opportunity to reclean it before it goes on to the next step. And with HLB, some of them, uh, the aldehydes in particular, have fixative properties, so 
that the aldehyde will adhere right to the residual soil and make it even harder to clean that next time. So basically, if you're over the what you set as your past level for ATP, you need to go back and reclean it again before you go to the next step. So how do you set up a cleaning monitoring program? So the first thing you have to do is you have to select which one you want to use. All right, there's publications that are out there. Manufacturers have you know, clinical, technical information to help you make those kinds of decisions. And some of the AMI standards, particularly in the end endoscopy or um, ST91, which is processing flexible and semi-rigid endoscopes in healthcare settings, which is very near the update of being finalized. But even in the, the current one from 2015, it does talk about, you know, some of the considerations when you're going to select your individual marker. And then you need to set up policies and procedures. So who's going to be responsible? How are you going to document it? What's the process for looking at that data? What do you do when it fails? And then what is your plan around education, your training, and the competency assessment for the people who are going to be doing these tests? And then what you do is in the key components of the monitoring plan is you have to say your test plan and test points. So that is what are you going to test and where on the individual device are you going to test it, okay? And then you figure out what is going to be your pass-fail threshold. Now, even though the manufacturer may give you a recommendation, you may find that you can do much better than that and you want to set your cleaning threshold or what is that pass-fail level at a different level than what the manufacturer is recommending. You can get information out of publications. There's lots of data out there to help choose what your pass-fail threshold will be. And then you have to figure out how often are you going to do it. Are you going to do it on every flexible endoscope? Are you going to only do it on those that are the highest risk ones? What types of surgical instruments are you going to do it? Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about like when in just a moment. And then how are you going to look at that data? Who's going to look at that data? How often are you going to look at that data? And then how do you report that out? So those are the components of a cleaning monitoring program. And when you start to use these indicators, you need to answer those questions. What are we going to test? How often? What's the pass and the fail? Um, and then how are we going to look at the data? So cleaning pass-fail threshold. So there's some information here, and I kind of mentioned some of this here. So you want to define what clean means before testing. And, you know, we often hear, hear somebody say, well, how clean is clean? There are values that are out there that are published in the literature and references in some standards. So personally, I think that we have that, that answer. Now, in most cases, we can do much better than what those benchmarks that are out there, and that should be the goal, because the better we do a cleaning, then the more effective that subsequent disinfection and sterilization process will be. So that pass-fail threshold will depend on the technologies used. Look at the manufacturer's information. I mentioned for ATP specifically, different manufacturers of ATP systems have different scales. So you can't use a swab from one manufacturer and a luminometer from another. Not a good thing to do. You're not getting a adequate, an accurate result. And then they should be independently validated for use of flexible endoscopes. And what does that mean? Either what the manufacturer is telling you or um, what's published in the standards or in published papers. So the monitoring plan needs to be obviously like everything we do, you know, compliant with, with current standards and guidelines and manufacturers of these systems have technical data that helps you, you know, figure that out and set that all up. So make sure that you have that and that you're getting that from the manufacturer. And then you're designing your test plan. So as I said, a test plan is what are you going to test? And the test points are where are you going to test them? And there's different options. So I'm giving you some examples here of what some different facilities do. So for endoscopy, you know, you could choose to monitor every endoscope after each use. Um, there obviously there's a cost associated with that, um, and some facilities absolutely do that. Um, not all facilities. Or you could choose that each time I'm going to take those really high-risk endoscopes where there's lots of data about you know, outbreaks and things, um, including duodenoscopes, anything with an elevator wire or some sort of mechanical, you know, mechanism at the end of it. So that includes those EUS scopes and the EBUS bronchoscopy scopes and just bronchoscopes in general. Um, really high rates of infections and risk associated with those types of scopes. And some of the lower risk ones, like colonoscopes and gastroscopes, maybe you don't monitor those quite so often. So you need to determine that. And then you determine where on that endoscope are you going to actually take the little sample, where you're going to put the swab to see if there's any residual clinical soil and take a reading. 
So the manufacturers um, are, are these systems are recommending, you know, you need to at a minimum do the instrument or inspection channel, right? Because that's the one that's used the most. And if for these um, elevator mechanism scopes, like the duodena scopes and EUS and EBA scopes, you need to test that elevator mechanism because with the outbreaks associated with CRE and, and uh, duodena scopes, that elevator mechanism was found really to be the high, high risk area. It's got a little tiny channel that is hard to clean and it's hard to get underneath that elevator mechanism itself. But a lot of facilities also test other areas like outer distal end, the control handle and instrument port. Basically those areas that get used and touched a lot is that increasing the risk of contamination. So how often you need to do that, so we've kind of talked a little bit about that. There's another one, though, that it's important to probably do monitoring when you first have a device and the reason, a new device. And the reason is, is that that sets your baseline. And so over time, you know, a new device comes into your facility, right? You have to clean it and reprocess it before it can be used. So if you initially then get a baseline, you know, cleaning verification test, you know on a brand new device, this is what it is at. And so over time, then you can track particular for that specific device, what those other, you know, at each time that you clean it, you can track and see, okay, what's the result now? And what we see in a lot of the data that comes out in his publications as well, Corey Offset has done some very, very nice, thorough um, comprehensive publications related specifically to this of showing that over time, you know, the devices become deteriorated and your cleaning monitoring values go up. Um, and so it can help you understand, is this particular endoscope, or for that matter, a surgical instrument, is it becoming damaged? Do I need to send it out for repair? And some of the databases that these um, systems offer that for the quantitative systems like ATP, you can download the data information into a database. In fact, the newer systems do it automatically for you. And then you can look at that and say, okay, I'm going to pick out, you know, X, Y, Z, um, EVA scope, and I'm going to look and see, you know, what the results are over time. And if you see it's gradually cre creeping up, and then more often than not, you have to go through two cleanings or three cleanings to, before you can get it underneath, right, that benchmark or that clean enough level, then it's probably telling you it's becoming damaged and that there's some biofilm that's, filled, that's forming and that you need to send it out for repair. Um, so monitoring frequency and, rec you know, there's lots of ways you can do it. Again, manufacturers of some of these systems will give you some technical information to be able to do that. And then also in the new ST91 that's coming out, is there's more detail around it, and specifically what to do for certain types of endoscopes. And so I talked, mentioned uh, briefly on kind of the data that's available. And so an important, really, really important thing for you to consider is, is that you know, you have data is power, right? If you have data, it can prove that you did things correctly. It also allows you to do this sort of tracking and trending and see if things are changing over time. You can use some of the data analysis to say, okay, I'm going to change something in my process. Does that have an effect on my cleaning? I'm going to change my detergent. You know, you can use cleaning monitoring results to see if it has any effect on that. I'm going to implement some auto an automated flusher you know, that looking at the data from these quantitative methods help you understand whether they have an impact or they don't have an impact. And But it's also important if you have these systems, you shouldn't not look at the data. You know, you get an immediate sort of pass fail with an ATP system, but that's helpful, that's great, that tells you kind of keep that going on to the next step. But doing the analysis of the overall data, maybe by scope type, where you're testing, even by individual staff members, um, or a specific endoscope, you know, by serial number, it's going to tell you what's happening and give you ideas um, on how to overall improve this process. Um, data analysis, I mean, this is an example of one of the systems that shows you, you know, kind of what you get. This is a dashboard for an endoscope, and it's basically saying, okay, over this time period, and I'm not really seeing on here, but let's say it was over, you know, a, a lot of the data is up on top. So on that day, on November 5th, or oh, it was over a year. Um, so you can set any time frame you want to look at it. So, you know, over that year, about 70% passed, but about 30% failed. If you weren't testing for that, you wouldn't know that that 30, 32% had failed, right, the cleaning process. 
And it also then gives you an idea of like, okay, which one is it? Because it actually will allow you to track sort of by which is the one that we're having, we're seeing failures and that we have to go back and re-clean. So it allows you to track the scope. It, you can look at it by the individual technician doing the, the cleaning and reprocessing. You can track it by department. Um, and this is a real-world example of a study that was published in 2018. And what it showed is, is that you know, they were testing the working channel. They were testing those two endoscope types, so linear EUS and the duodenoscope. And then some of them were doing it on a regular basis and some of them on a non-regular basis. So what it also showed is when they started this first quarter of July 2015 is that, you know, they're getting a fairly high number of endoscopes that failed. And as they started to do the testing, they saw it helped them improve their ability to clean those, and you know, those elevator mechanisms effectively. So the numbers came down. So if it gets down here, and if you actually put sort of a straight line across this area, there's a little, it's still continuing to go down. But if all of a sudden you're seeing it's going up, then that may trigger either we need to retrain somebody, but probably more likely, unless you have a brand new employee, more likely that there's some damage on those, you know, a endoscope or um, maybe multiple endoscopes that you need to look at. Because they do get damaged over time with the wear and tear, and it happens fairly quickly. So EVS, what is a pass and what is a fail? Again, the manufacturers of these systems will make some recommendations. Um, and there are clinical studies that set a level of 250 RLU is recommended. Um, and, you know, for EVS, it's different. So if a device you're processing, it's a pass-fail, right? And if it's a fail, you need to go back. In environmental, the standards are a little bit different with that, and it doesn't have to be 100%, but you set a goal. You want 80% of your rooms to be above this pass level, according to a CDC toolkit that's available. Um, so that's the way it is. There's a difference between the two and, and likely because maybe the risk is higher um, with uh, instruments and endoscopes versus um, environmental. Um, and just the, also a consideration is the ability to achieve that. It's um, probably unlikely that it's 100%. Um, and usually the rooms are cleaned and then they go in and get audited at some point. It's not always, you're not always able to hold that room before the next patient comes in in order to be able to um, you know, go back and reclean it again. But again, look at those manufacturers' information that's available. And here's an example of sort of a test plan, right? Because you're saying we're going to do, you know, five, or we're going to do one room for every 20 discharges. So that's about 5% of our rooms. And we're going to test five places in that room. So that's part of your test plan. Um, for environmental monitoring, I already did talk about that, but, you know, for high-risk areas and equipment, all right, so if it's in the ICU or the OR, many facilities say, yeah, 80% is not good enough for me, and I need to have 100%, and they test immediately after the process, the cleaning process is completed before that room is released to use for the next patient. So surgical instruments, we talked a lot about endoscopes and we talked about in rooms, but now let's talk about surgical instruments. So AORN has a recommendation for this um, in their 2014, and I think that that document actually is under review right now. We, as one of the manufacturers, also provide a recommended list. Other manufacturers of these systems will also, but it's basically, right, those that have complex geometries and lumens and that are hard to get clean. And so they'll have a certain number of these that then you would want to be able to monitor on a periodic basis. If you manually clean these instruments, you do it after manual cleaning. If you do use a washer disinfector, which we do for the majority of them, you monitor it after the wash and disinfector step. It's not after sterilization. It's after the cleaning process because of testing cleaning. The numbers, again, how you establish them are the same as what I had talked about. A lot of facilities will use this 150 as a pass, 151 as a fail. And then um, test plan again, you know, so here's an example of that. You could, fit, you know, pick out 10 of them, monitor those 10. You could monitor them every day, every shift, maybe after, you know, once a week. Um, it's really kind of up to you, but if you start monitoring and you see you have a lot of failures, then you, it gives you information of what you should go look at to try to improve that process. But there's some examples here. And then high risk are instruments, you know, all facilities are different, so you need to define what those are. But and we know those that can't be washed in an automatic washer, like batteries and drills, you know, the endoscopy. I'm sorry, the robotic instruments, really difficult to be able to get clean, are some ideas of those really high-risk ones. 
And again, this is an example of what could be that monitoring frequency or the, the features within that test plan, the policies in the test plan. So I'm not going to go through a lot of this because, you know, our speakers did a much better job with this. But if you look at these slides, we'll talk, um, you know, about the outbreaks, the duodenoscope outbreaks were really an issue, but they're still happening. They don't think they've gone away. You know, we knew about it a long time ago. Um, they're still on, this is from 2016, there's newer data that is in the bibliography attached to this. Um, but there's still lots of publications that are showing, you know, that there's issues related to this. But this is a, a slide I want to bring to your attention is this was the Johns Hopkins study. And they looked at different endoscopes. So they were six states, lots of facilities. And what they did is they compared the outcomes from outpatient and inpatient settings for new post-procedural endoscopy infections requiring treatment within seven days. And this is where those numbers come from. And you can see they're different. But the bottom line is it's not like there's no risk. There's pretty significant risk with some of these procedures. And the important part is those that got infection, a high percentage required hospitalization, and not just a day or two, but a long day and deaths occur from that. And they vary depending on what they are. And then this slide really talks about the, kind of a summary of these, public, these publications of what they say the problem is. So I do want you to pay attention to this. These are the things that are risks, and you should look at that. And you should, if you've done risk assessments in your facilities, I speak on that frequently. You can look at this list and say, okay, here's the things that could potentially go wrong for us. So what can we put in place to be able to, to impact that? And so lots of things related to, you know, where there's potential risk. Um, there's some new guidelines that are published. You're going to see more and more of these coming out. Um, and there's certainly a challenge to continue to follow that. Corey Ofsted has done a lot of work around saying, you know, can we do this? Uh, even back in 2010, that it's really, really difficult by a lot of people to do this effectively because it is a big challenge. But cleaning monitoring can be a really important part of your quality control program because it's going to tell you, did you get it clean enough for it to go on to that next step and have a higher likelihood of that step being effective? You want to implement validated real-time cleaning verification. The manufacturers do the validation. When you use it, you're verifying that that cleaning has been performed well enough and effectively so that the subsequent disinfection and sterilization is effective. And using these rapid cleaning monitors or cleaning verification tests like ATP for routine quality control of your manual cleaning effectiveness and for periodic quality control for your surgical instruments of your automated cleaning processes and environmental can only help to be able to allow you to have a better quality control program and ultimately reduce the risk of that patient of contracting an infection from the devices that we process. So with that, there are a couple of slides, lots of references. If so inclined to go look at those, please go ahead. Um, you'll have this presentation that will be available. And with that, if there's an opportunity for any questions, I think we have a few minutes left. Tried to make up some time. <laughs> we have a few minutes left. I'm happy to take any questions. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Janet. Uh, we did have some great questions come through for you. So uh, I will just get right into those questions. The first one that came through is any idea on correlation of ATP levels to the amount of organisms present on the surface? For mm -hmm. example, 100 moles of ATP equals 100 CFU of bacteria. Yeah, there's not, there's not data that associates with that. And one of the, the tricky things is that, you know, people want that. <laughs> Everybody would like to have that, right? A really fast, really quick, inexpensive test that you can get an immediate result to tell you how many organisms are there, right? It doesn't work like that. It's not defining organisms. Remember, it's a high energy compound present in all organic material. So it's not telling, correlating specifically to the amount of organisms. We know organisms, you know, exist in uh, serum, right? But it's going to measure all of the gunk or clinical soil, and it can't parse out just the organisms. And that's true right after cleaning, and that's true if, even if you used, you, you tested ATP at the end of the entire processing cycle. Um, and unfortunately, there's a lot of publications that say have done that. And they'll say, well, we tested at the end of the cycle, but it didn't correlate with our microbial culture, so therefore ATP doesn't work. It doesn't do that. That's apples and oranges, right? That's like saying that I'm going to try to, you know, you know, screw the um, my hinge into my door with a hammer. 
right? They're different tools for testing different things. So, yeah, the answer to that is no, it doesn't work like that. Okay. Uh, this next question says, when surgical instruments are washed thermally through washer disinfectors, they undergo higher temperatures. So does it fixate bio burden and biofilms during the process? And when doing ATP, would it yield a higher value? So if it's not effectively cleaned, and typically with washer disinfectors, what happens is that you know the process itself is super effective if the geometry of the instrument is exposed to those conditions, right? So the agitation, the pressure, the temperature, all of that. Um, and so, you know, the, the, the likelihood that, you know, a surface of an instrument would not be effectively, you know, clean with a washer disinfector that was functioning properly is really low. The trick is, is that it's those complex geometries that maybe you didn't open up the instrument. You know, maybe the surfaces were, you know, still locked together, that then that washer disinfector, you know, wouldn't be able to reach that. Um, I don't believe that the temperature of the washer disinfector fixates things. I mean, it certainly can dry on surfaces. You see spots and things like that. Um, I don't believe it would give you a higher ATP result, though. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you for that. Uh, a clarification question. At what point in the process of reprocessing endoscopes do you perform the ATP test? So it's done after the manual cleaning step. Um, so um, you would do it after the manual cleaning, you're doing your manual cleaning, you've done your leak testing, you're ready to take then that, that endoscope to the, um, uh, high, the endoscope reprocessor or you're ready to dry it before sterilization, you would do it right then. Okay, thank you. Uh, this attendee says, thank you for your presentation. You have mentioned denatured proteins when you talk about protein-based methods. Could you mm -hmm. clarify this point? Are you suggesting denatured proteins are not detected by protein quantification methods? Um, no, they are. Denatured proteins will be detected by, you know, most of them, not all of them. So it depends, again, on the technology. That would be a question depending on the specific test that you're using um, of whether or not that manufacturer has done that testing to ensure that it's detecting de denatured proteins. But protein tests can detect denatured proteins, yes. Yeah. Okay. Do you know how many CFU do you need to be detected by the ATP system? Okay. So another question where we're kind of mixing things up a little bit, right? So ATP is not detecting CFU. Um, it's detecting overall clinical soil. There have been some studies that have shown that you can have very low levels of CFU and it's below the threshold of an ATP system, the ability to detect it. Um, but what it's not, it's not, again, not, and there's also been situations, I think, in some publications that we've seen that, you know, we've had extremely high um, uh, CFU levels and that the ATP, you know, test came back and it passed. You know, keep in mind, it's not measuring specific CFU. So when you're asking the system to tell you, you know, what is the lowest level of CFU it can detect and what's the highest level of CFU it can detect and for those things to correlate, the system won't do that because it's not measuring the CFU. It's not saying, okay, I'm only going to pick out what is the uh, live organisms, right? So CFUs are colony-forming units of microorganisms that you've taken a sample of. The ATP system doesn't say, I'm going to only pick out the, the live organisms and I'm not going to measure the rest of it. So it's going to measure anything that's there where ATP is present and it will be in the full clinical soil and organic compounds. Um, and so, again, if you see some data like that or you look at that, you should look at that with a wary eye because it's, de it's detecting ATP. It's not intended, like a culture, to detect a particular organism. Okay, wonderful clarification. Thank you for that. How would you implement ATP testing for orthopedics? So for orthopedic devices, it would be similar to what we discussed in this um, in the presentation, is that you want to define what are those orthopedic devices that are most challenging to clean. And it's the same as what I had mentioned here, is complex, think about complex geometries. Smooth stainless steel surfaces, not really a concern. In fact, I wouldn't test those if I were you, um, unless it was a really old instrument and it was damaged and it visually, you know, didn't look good. 
Um, but if it is anything in an orthopedic instruments, you have a lot of that, right? You have a lot of lumened instruments. You have a lot of things with hinges and teeth and all sorts of things. And so you need to look at those complex instruments. You know, pick out a sample of them, meaning that, you know, um, determine the number of particular devices that you're going to choose. And then say, say you have five of the same set. You're going to pick out the complex devices out of three of those sets, and you're going to test those and see what your baseline is and then go through the cleaning process. And if that baseline is above the benchmark that you've set, either what the manufacturer is telling you to start with, or what data, like publications and papers are telling you to start with, and what you would do is do that that set of testing. That becomes your baseline, and then you take look at your cleaning process and see if there's anything in the cleaning process that needs to be changed if you're failing when you initially are doing that first set of testing. And then after that, right, get it down so it's below, and then determine what's that frequency. So there's data out there that some of the um, laparoscopes you know, have been associated, some of the uh, shavers have been associated, you know, with uh, residual debris and organic, you know, buildup and biofilm over time. Um, and so look at AORN as a good reference. And then again, the manufacturer will give you the list of the items that have been shown to be most problematic. Now, with orthopedic sets, the surgical instruments is once you've got it down below that level and you're confident that your staff is maintaining that level, then you may not need to do it every time. You could just do it periodically. Maybe once a week, we're going to take a sample set out of our one or two orthopedic trays, and then we're going to retest them to make sure that we're maintaining that level of cleaning. All right, wonderful. <clears throat> As we close, uh, there was one additional question that came through that says, excellent presentation. When can we see something like that again? So a note to both Beyond <laughs> Clean and 3M, <laughs> more of this, please. <laughs> Very good. Well, thanks, everybody, uh, for your attention. Yeah. Great. Hope it was really Wonderful. informative for you, and have a good day. Thank you, Janet. And as surgery schedules begin to expand beyond urgent and emergent procedures, what are some of the challenges OR teams face? Well, this next presentation will lay out a roadmap for returning to surgery, including information about PPE challenges, aerosol-generating procedures, proper respirator donning and doffing techniques, and respiratory and eye protection scenarios. So please tune in in about 15 minutes while Kim Prinson and Jenna Lindsay from 3M give tips to building your OR team's confidence when caring for patients in returning to surgery. We'll see you in a little bit. <laughs> 